Welcome to the Family Bible Study, Tilling the Soil. Thank you for joining me once again for our Monday Night Digital Small Group. Now, to give you guys an idea of what we'll be studying from in tonight's program, we will continue studying the establishment of the early church as recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. But first things first, before we get started with the program, let's begin in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to gather together like this, to gather together for yet another Monday night, to come together to look at your word, Lord. So please be in our presence. Open our hearts and our minds to what you wish to teach here tonight and help us to grow ever closer to you through your revealed word to us. And I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So for tonight's lesson, let's begin in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So following on the heels of Jesus ascending into heaven and the remaining apostles choosing Matthias to become the newest apostle to replace Judas, while the 120 disciples of Christ were still waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit as promised by Christ, we find the disciples all together again, all gathered together in one place when the day of Pentecost fully came upon them. Now, the the day of Pentecost for Christians is remembered as the day the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples. But for the Jewish people at the time, the day of Pentecost, Pentecost was a feast day celebration held 50 days after the Passover and was representative of the wheat harvest. Now, Jewish tradition also looked on the celebration of Pentecost as the day the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. So if we pop on over to that law of Moses and turn to Leviticus chapter 23, we can see this feast day being described and commanded by the Lord for his people to celebrate it on a yearly basis. I'm still sick, so I am still tripping over words. And I'm pretty sure I'll do what I did last week and put on a bunch of, a bunch of plurals. But... It is what it is. So with that, let's look at verse 15. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Uh, This would be the the Passover feast would be the uh, seven Sabbaths. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, When you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord, you shall bring from your dwellings two loaves, two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. And ephah was a unit of measurement for the Israelites. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offerings and their drink offerings as an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Now, personally, I don't know if that would actually make a very sweet smell itself. It doesn't sound like it exactly be sweet, but really it's speaking more of the obedience of the Lord or to the Lord by his people that would make the offering sweet to the Lord. It's more our obedience than what we're doing. It's just the fact that we are doing as he asked. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats as a sin offering and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of a peace offering. The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. And they shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. And you shall proclaim on the same day that is a that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout the generations. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. You know, not to get off on too much of a tangent, but... Reading this brings to mind one common misconception. 
that I hear a lot. That being the idea that the God of the Old Testament was full of wrath and vengeance and the God of the New Testament was full of love and kindness. But there is no God of the Old Testament or God of the New Testament, just God. And he is the same yesterday as he is today and he will be the same tomorrow. So the Old Testament God was supposed to be full of wrath and vengeance, right? But instead, we see love and kindness right here in this passage. We see the Old Testament God, as it were, showing that he is commanding his people to leave a portion of their crops for the poor. If they drop the wheat on the ground as they're threshing it, you don't leave, you don't pick that up. Leave that for passersby to glean off the ground. Leave that for the stranger. Leave that for the poor. To be kind and caring to those less fortunate of them. Commanding his people to be loving and kind. Now, if God seems to be more wrathful and vengeful in the Old Testament during our reading than he seems to be in the New Testament, one, you probably haven't reached, reached Revelation yet. Two, just remember what was happening in the context of it. God in the Old Testament was in the process of leading his people and separating them from the world and its false paganism. In the New Testament, that was already accomplished and the Lord was fulfilling his covenants with his people. So it's two different situations which is a father having two children you react differently in different situations well god is our father he reacted differently in two different situations it's not one or the other god was always full of loving and enduring kindness but sometimes he had to be a little bit harder with his children in the old testament than he needed to be in the new testament because the New Testament was about him reconciling to his people. Now, one thing this portion of Leviticus that is interesting to me is the ritual of the priest having to wave two loaves from the harvest, for which Charles Spurgeon had this to say about this particular Pentecost where the disciples would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Were there not two loaves, not only shall Israel be saved, but the multitude of the Gentiles shall be turned unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, the arrival of the Holy Spirit was a fulfillment of this ritual by the high priest in that both sets of people, both loaves, were going to be offered the chance at salvation in the remission of sin. Or as David Guzik says, on the Old Testament day of Pentecost, Israel received the law. On the New Testament day of Pentecost, the church, all of us who humble ourselves to the authority of the Lord, received the spirit of grace in fullness. You know, sometimes I feel like as Christians, we think of the Holy Spirit as being less than the Father and the Son. We almost seem to view the Spirit as a vehicle used by God to, his, to accomplish his will in the world. And I mean, that is sort of true. But we need to remember that what indwells us isn't a thing of God. The Holy Spirit isn't of God. The Holy Spirit is God. The third third of the Trinity, if you will. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he is not less than the Father or less than the Son. He is the third third. He is never less, but always equal in power and divinity to the Father and the Son. Simply an expression of the divine nature of Yahweh in a different form than the spiritual form of the Father in heaven or the physically manifested form of the Son. And we have this indwelling of the Holy Spirit in fullness. Not merely upon us, as so many in the Old Testament had, but in us. And that comes with a responsibility. 
That's what James was speaking of when he said faith without works is dead. Our works don't save us. They add nothing to our salvation. God's grace does that. But being saved, being filled with the Holy Spirit, should show fruit being born in our lives. Good, sweet fruit. If we don't, we have to question whether or not we have God's grace upon us, whether or not we are saved, whether or not we've truly placed our trust in him. Now, because of that, we have a responsibility to listen to the calling of the Lord and the moving of the Spirit and not fight against it, but allow it to move us in the direction of his will. Because when we do, we will bear good fruit in his name. Good fruit that helps nourish the health of those making their way to to his kingdom. Don't ignore the call. Don't allow the whispers of the enemy to lead us astray. We know the voice of our shepherd. Sometimes we feel like we don't. You know, um, years ago, uh, my old cat before he passed, when Malia was about one, my daughter was about one, my cat got out. And he's an indoor cat. He was gone for about five, six days. No idea if he was alive, anything happened to him. So I would go to the local vets, animal shelters, look at other animals. And I know this is a poor analogy in a way, but just stick with me. And so often I would see a cat that looked similar to him. And I wanted that to be my cat so bad that sometimes I'd be like, that has to be my cat. And then I'd wonder, how come I don't remember exactly what my cat looks like? Then one day, my neighbor says, I think I saw your cat underneath my shed. I crawled on the ground, looked under this broken piece of wood under the shed, and with one look at that dirty, dingy cat, I knew that was my cat. We know the voice of our shepherd. Sometimes in our desire to find and hear the voice of Jesus, when we want to hear the voice of God, we hear the other voices and we feel the other pulls and we wonder, are we sure this is our shepherd? And it happens a lot if we are young in our walk and we're still trying to learn the voice of our shepherd. But we will know when we hear it there's a distinction among all other voices that when we hear it we will know and this is one way we can tell and it's does the call ask us to glorify the lord or to glorify ourselves does the call line up with the word of god Or does it sound more worldly? Because the Lord will only lead us closer to him, never deeper into the world. We will know his call. We just have to listen to it and trust in the spirit dwelling inside of us. So after all that, let's actually get to verse 2. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. And filled the whole house where they were sitting. A sound like a violent wind. You know, that's interesting because it seems unusual. But it had a purpose. One I see at least. But we'll we'll get to that in a few verses. But it's also interesting because the word for spirit and wind or breath are the same in both Hebrew and Greek. And I mean that, that wind and spirit are the same word in in both languages, not that both languages use the same word. And then if we think back to the Old Testament, there are several places where the Lord uses his breath. The spirit of God hovering over the waters of the formless void, the empty earth in Genesis chapter 1-2. Of course, the Lord breathing the breath of life 
into the clay form of Adam, and in doing so, bringing life to all of humanity. And, you know, and there are other places, Ezekiel over the dry bones. So it's interesting to see where God once breathed life, that breath of life in the mankind. We find the Lord breathing again during the rebirth of mankind. Because Christ said, we need to be born again of the Spirit. And that's exactly what's happening right here to his disciples. They're being renewed. Now, the disciples weren't strangers to the Holy Spirit and all of its works. They had seen the Spirit operating in conjunction with Christ for years. They themselves were given a taste of walking in the Spirit. When Christ sent them out in groups of two, as recorded in Luke 10. So let's look at that for a second, starting with verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two before his face in every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The harvest is great. There are many people that need to be saved. But there are few people willing to do the work to take the message of the Lord forth. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Basically, I'm sending you as my disciples out innocent among the corruption of the world. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. This was to show that their provisions and success were the work of the Lord and not of their own hands. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Basically, don't impose on people. Just live in the generosity of those with willing hearts. Don't become a burden to those people. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city, which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than that city. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Siron, Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are you exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. Deliver the gospel, but don't force it. Some will accept, some will reject, and ultimately their fate is their own. Because he's listing out the fact that the Jewish cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, woe to them because the Jews keep rejecting Jesus. But if he had gone to Tyre and Sidon, two Greek cities, two Gentile cities, they would have accepted his message. He who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. And then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be any means hurt you, shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Basically, remember from whom your power came. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. 
See, the power the disciples had wielded wasn't theirs. It wasn't truly subject to them, not really. It was God allowing them to wield a portion of his power. We actually see this in, uh, I believe, I'm going to say 1 Kings, but it could be 2 Kings. When the king of Israel is sending soldiers out to capture Elijah, and Elijah keeps saying, if I am still seen as worthy in God's eyes, let fire rain down upon you. Because Elijah knew his power did not come from him. The miracles he performed weren't his miracles. That's a misnomer we use in the church a lot. Oh, what was a miracle of Moses? What was a miracle of Elisha? There were no miracles of any prophet. There were merely prophets used as tools for the miracles of the Lord. It was God allowing them to wield a portion of his power like these disciples here. See, on their own, they were weak. They were mere men, but in his power, they were mighty. One thing our pride and ego always wants to do is cause us to view blessings and provisions as the result of our works, as being the result of our efforts. And we see it all the time, especially in our ever online world. Uh, A patient thanks Jesus for helping them pull through an illness. A driver narrowly avoids an accident and thanks Jesus. In the comments under these posts or these videos, the comments of those living smack in the middle of their pride are always basically the same. They respond, why are you thanking Jesus? It's the doctor who saved you. You were the one who responded and steered out of the danger. Why are you thanking Jesus? See, and it's simply because they are blinded by their own sense of, of false self-worth and ego that they can't see the providence of the Lord. They can't see his blessings. All they see is the result, not the hand that guided it. They don't see that it was a gift of the Lord that allowed the doctor to be a doctor. It's They don't see that it is the gift of the Lord that guided the quick reflexes of the driver. This also leads to an inverse. So the person who crashed wasn't blessed? So the person who died of cancer wasn't wasn't blessed and wasn't worthy in the eyes of the Lord? And these comments only come because those people can't separate themselves from the world. They can't see the truth because they refuse to submit themselves to the Lord. And the truth is that, yeah, in some instances, God has removed his hand of provision and protection from those who refuse him. And in some instances, as painful as it seems, for all involved, going home to be reunited with him is a far greater blessing than remaining to suffer here. And sometimes that trial that you go through isn't about you, it's about those around you. So, when we only view things through the lens of this temporal, material world, we fall into a kind of tunnel vision that keeps us from seeing the bigger picture, that God is in control, whether we are blessed in abundance or oppressed by demonic forces, whether God gives us over to the sinfulness we demand to live in, or he pulls us up out of the darkness to which we've fallen, but beg him to deliver us from. God is sovereign, sovereign over all. But where some Christians go wrong is that he is more than that. He is perfect. He is ever loving and eternally just. So we as his followers, as being submitted to his will, can trust that no matter what happens, it is happening for a greater good. Even if that greater good isn't something we ever live to see. Now, I know that doesn't always leave a good taste in people's mouths. But truth, truth often doesn't.
They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Tongues of fire. The purifying flame of the Lord. Yeah, it's a scene we've seen in the past. Isaiah saying he was a man of unclean lips. And having the angel of the Lord place a burning coal over his mouth to purify him for service to the Lord. And here we find the purifying flame of the Lord bestowing power upon the disciples of Christ to make them ready for service to his coming kingdom. But not a fire over them all, not as a group. See, the Lord so often blessed his children as a group throughout the Old Testament. Abraham argued with the Lord to save Sodom if only 10 people could be found to be righteous in the city. In the end, the angels were only able to save four. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Lot's sons-in-laws laughed at him. And God's judgment and remained in the city. None of his friends, none of his neighbors wanted to listen. God was looking for ten, but only found four. And those four were only saved, really, for Abraham's sake. The northern kingdom sent into exile as a nation. Not just the wicked, but all dragged off to Assyria. The southern kingdom, same thing happened, judged as a nation together and dragged off to Babylon. But not here. Not post-Christ, if you will. No longer would the children of God be judged as a nation. Because now the promise of Abraham's covenant was fulfilled and Christ coming as a blessing for the entire world and not just the nation of Israel. Now that he had come, no longer would the children of God be grouped. Now we were to be judged as individuals, each of us responsible for seeking him and humbling ourselves before him on our own. No grandchildren for God, only children. We can't make others come to Christ. We can't convert anyway. We can't even convert our own children, let alone a stranger. We are accountable for ourselves. Responsible for taking the message of the gospel to others. Responsible for raising our children in the ways of the Lord. So we hope they will hopefully never depart from him. But accountable only for our own salvation. Because we can only control our decisions in our heart. We can't control the hearts of others. But that is why we pray they come to a saving knowledge in Christ. Because they need that knowledge. Our faith can't do it. I wish it could. I wish I could trust the Lord into my children's salvation and my family's salvation. But I can't. They need to come to his saving grace on their own. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit that is completely taken out of context nowadays, especially by those in the charismatic Christian circles. Taken so out of context that they will often deny someone is even saved if that individual doesn't act out in the same performative manner that they do. They view speaking in tongues as babbling and clicking and clacking, just nonsensical talk, where Scripture never describes it in such a way. Now, we can act, ask why they act out in such a fashion, knowing that it's not coming from the Spirit, and when they know for a fact that they are simply acting out in a performative manner, like why would you go along with that? Why would you act like a fool and pretend that you're spiritual? And really, it's because of what I just said a moment ago. These flawed, at best, pastors claim that to not act in this performative manner means you have no salvation. And no one wants to hear that because that is terrifying. You don't want to hear that you're not saved because you're not acting like a fool and rolling all over the floor and swimming in place or walking into a wall. 
So they perform the charismatic act. So their salvation and standing with the Lord isn't questioned by those around them. Which is a wicked way to act for a so-called pastor. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm actually not a cessationist who believes that the Holy Spirit no longer bestows gifts like he did in the, in the early church. I actually think he does. But, so I still think people do actually speak in tongues. I do think people do have the gift of not so much prophecy as new revelations, because that ended with John, but new illuminations of the word. I do feel that people sometimes have a gift of healing. I do think that people can cast out demons and and save people from demonic oppression. But, and the big but is, I can use the discernment Christ has gifted me to view the fraud from the faithful. And there is a lot more fraud than there is faithful. See, because the idea of speaking in tongues listed here is the speaking of an actual language. Each disciple gained the gift to preach the gospel in a language not their own, one they had not previously known. Now, Paul does mention speaking in an angelic tongue, one only understood by God, essentially. But let's not pretend that's the same as babbling incoherently to appear spiritual. Because all speech in church should be edifying to the brethren, should be to educate and bring those in your flock closer to God. Babbling brings no one closer to the Lord. It's a performance and should be looked down upon as one. Because as Paul also says, if that angelic tongue is spoken in a gathering of a church, there should be someone there who can interpret the speech. And that speech should be edifying because God would never offer up wisdom for his children with no way to comprehend it. The gifts of the Spirit are very real, but be wary of anyone displaying them openly, especially if they're displaying them for the adulation of a crowd in front of a camera for money. Because as we read in Luke 10, do not rejoice that the Spirit is subject to you. If someone is seeking the approval and applause of men, that's all the approval that person is ever going to receive. We need to be seeking the approval and applause of those in the heavens, of our Father who is seated on that throne, because he is the only one whose approval that will mean a single thing in the end. I said, I believe there are people who can cast out demons because I do believe in demon possession of unbelievers and demon oppression of believers. But if you hold a deliverance conference where all these people who can supposedly cast out demons hold a conference and people are paying money to have demons removed from them, there are people literally possessed of a demon and the demon chooses to spend money to go get removed from the person, that's a fraud. Because we can read the New Testament. Jesus cast out demons. None of them wanted to be casted out. They were quite happy where they were. Don't get fooled by frauds and wolves. Because if someone uses their Christianity to enrich themselves, they're a fraud and they're a wolf and they are hungry for you. Man, it's been 34 minutes and I'm only on verse five, but you know what? It is what it is. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under the heaven. Now, this is an important point per the many languages that were spoken. These may have been many different languages from all the surrounding nations, but they were all being spoken of the Jews still. 
not to the Gentiles yet. God first came to deliver the good news to his own people. Unfortunately and heartbreakingly, they wouldn't be the ones to truly take it to heart. It'd be the Gentiles who really took it to heart. People like myself, who have, unless I've never taken a DNA test or an ancestry test, but I don't think we're Jewish. I think we're British. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Heard this sound. Now, this is debatable as to what the, this sound was. Was it the sound of the mighty wind, the violent wind, or the multitude of languages being spoken? Now, personally, as I alluded to earlier, I think the Holy Spirit descending like a violent wind served a purpose. And that was to bring those in the surrounding area out of their homes, out of their inns, anywhere else they may have been. They were probably in the temple area, gathered as the 120. So it would have been people around the, the temple. And they would have been brought out into the open where they'd hear the gospel in their own tongue, their own language, and be able to have that opportunity to seek out the eternal gift that only God can offer. Now, I'm sure there were many who heard the wind and thought, yeah, I'm not going out there. What was that? But then went out hearing the commotion of the multitude of languages being spoken. But I feel that like when we hear a really loud sound outside our own homes, we're, we tend to be drawn to the window to check out what exactly that was because we want to protect ourselves. And the wind probably caused the people to take note that something was going on, something that required their attention. Oh, my throat. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language. You know, this was actually slightly insulting because the reason for mentioning that they were Galileans was because those from Galilee were seen as not nah, being the brightest of people. That was the stereotype, whether it was correct or not. Like how people from the coasts here in the U.S., from big cities like Philadelphia and New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco, Look down on those from the Midwest and southern portions of the country as being dumb bumpkins. Even though those major cities have underperforming and often failing school districts. Luckily, we live in the school district of Philadelphia, which overall might not be that great, but our local school is actually really good. Meaning, the people from the coasts aren't really smarter by any measure. Just bigoted and tribalistic. So, these travelers in Jerusalem, for the Feast of the Pentecost, were amazed that these northern country bumpkins could speak their languages when they could barely speak Aramaic correctly. Perithians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Thygria and Panthelia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Cretans, and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Not babble, not incomprehensible, not clickety clackety, yabba dabba do, but completely understood. I was trying not to do the yabba dabba do joke, but completely understood and declaring the wonders of the Lord preaching the glory of the gospel. Now, these were people who believed in the one true God of Israel already. But now they were hearing more than that. They were hearing not just the law of Moses and the prophets, not just the covenants of the Lord with his people, but of the fulfillment of them. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? They had no way to understand what was occurring. After all, they, they were just coming off of what we refer as the intertestament period, the period of silence where the Lord hadn't raised any new prophets for hundreds of years. But we know what this meant, though. 
we know what was happening when all of these disciples started speaking different languages. We know that the Great Commission had begun. The command to go forth and take the gospel to all who'd hear it. And the Holy Spirit gave them every language so they could go out everywhere and deliver it. And in this instance, the first audience to that gospel had just arrived. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have, set, they have had too much wine. You know, we're going to end right here, mainly because it's going really long. But we'll end here. We will pick up with Peter addressing the crowd in the next installment of Tilling the Soil. But we need to understand, when we take Christ into the world, mockery will follow us. In this world, we can praise God. We can salute Allah, which really is just the Arabic word for God. We can thank the universe. We can appeal to karma. We, we can speak about the pride of our ancestors. But once we proclaim Jesus, and more than that, once we speak about Jesus as he spoke about himself, as God, as the word that will outlive the world, as the absolute objective moral truth and author of creation, mockery and vileness will follow. Esoteric concepts of God, where everyone can live and let live and every path leads to heaven, those are acceptable to the world. And not just acceptable, they're applauded for being such a deep philosophical thinker. Because those are the broad path. And we know where that ends. But let us proclaim the truth of Christ as the way, the truth, the life, as the narrow path. And that's the definitive article. Not a way, a truth, a life, but the one and only. The world doesn't like that. Because the truth, that truth, requires submission, requires humility, requires one to place their pride and ego to the side in favor of the will of the Lord we follow. Truth is never appreciated. People prefer perspective over truth because perspective is subjective. That's why nowadays, They've begun to refer as their, to their perspective as their truth. Everyone has a truth now. Oh, the sky's orange. That's my truth. But what they truly have is a perspective. And perspectives are more often than not flawed. But appreciate it or not, we are called to speak truth, to relay truth the truth. As we read in Luke 10, if a person doesn't want to hear the truth, we don't have to bang our heads against the wall trying to get them to understand truth. We are simply called to deliver the truth, then brush the dust from our sandals and move on. But we have to at least to make that attempt. Mockery comes with the Great Commission. From the very first audience, the very first audience, when the Great Commission comes, mockery came with it. It always has and it always will. As Jesus said, they despise us because they despised him first. Same as it was with Samuel. The Israelites wanted a king like the other nations. And Samuel went to the Lord and said the people hated him. But the Lord had to remind Samuel that the people weren't rejecting Samuel. They loved Samuel. Who they were rejecting was the kingship of God. And to this day, people are still rejecting the authority and kingship of the Lord. But we can't let that be the thing that pulls us to and fro. We can't let that be the thing that guides us. Otherwise, we're no different in the world. We're treating our truth, the truth, as our perspective. But it's not. We can't be seeking affirmation, approval, and applause of men. We need to set our eyes higher because love for our neighbor may make us share the gospel, 
But our pride and that desire to find approval and applause will cause us to try and make our sharing of the gospel the focus point. Moving the focus from his divine work on the cross to our work in delivering the message. Anytime we are focusing on views and format and optics over the message in the simple delivery of it, we are shifting the focus from him to us. After all, are we trying to be seen as the messenger or are we trying to highlight the message? So we need to be wary of our motivations. Mockers and scoffers will find a way to pop up in some form or fashion. But Christ, Christ is always present, always lending us strength when we are working to bring glory to God, even when we're reluctant. He's still there, sometimes pushing even harder. So focus on what matters, not the mockers and the scoffers, not our pride and ego, but him. In the gracious gift, he is mercifully offered to all who accept it. The Great Commission continues to this day, and that audience is still out there still out there, thirsting for the living water of Christ, thirsting for us to go forth as he commanded and bring them a bucket, not of us, but of him. So that way they never have to thirst again. So, I hope everyone had a great time tonight, and let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for placing another lesson on my heart, Lord. Thank you so much for helping use me as a tool to bring forth your word. Lord, please let this be edifying to those who listen. Help it find someone who needs to hear this message. But most of all, Lord, help you be glorified. I am simply a tool. You are the one deserving of glory. Lord, help bless us, our friends, our families. It has been a nasty cold and flu season. I am still fighting this for the last three weeks, it feels like. I know my kids are on and off. I know my friends have been on and off with some nasty sicknesses, co-workers. Lord, help bless us with health. I know winter is long yet, but bless us in abundance, Lord. Bless us in the way that only you can. And I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And with that, blessing to everyone watching. And I hope to see you all back again for the next installment of Tilling the Soil.